Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Wow. There was so much conversation going on, I almost didn't want to break that up, you know. Um, it is good to see you here in worship, and what an interesting day, hasn't it been? You know, we had horizontal snow, we had bright, beautiful sunshine, it was uh, it's just such a weird day. But it's supposed to be quite warm tomorrow, so I'm very much looking forward to that. So i um, glad that you are all gathered here, and just checking to make, yep, that's on, Okay. Um, I want to say a special welcome to everybody who's worshiping at home. If you would please make sure that you make note that you have attended with us, put your name or some comments on the uh, on the notes on Facebook or on YouTube, and just oh, there it is. That wasn't on. Oh my gosh! Wow. So um, I don't know if we have to start over or not, but well, um, we'll just keep going. Okay, yeah. Um, well, welcome. We're glad to see all of you, too. I think you've been here before, haven't you? Tracy, is that right? Tasha. 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 Okay, sorry. All right. So this week we do have Loaves and Fishes on Monday and Thursday. We have Ad Board on um, Monday night. We're not having SPRC this this month, so um, if we're just going to start at 730 with the Administrative Board. Um, the Chosen, we have a two, I think, two more episodes to go before we're done with this season. So, And then cardio drumming has been a lot of fun on Wednesdays. Um, I think I think that's all, but um, of course, you know, we've got the, um, the, the Easter week coming up, and there's going to be several services that week, so we'll have uh, Palm Sunday is going to be, a, or, you know, the Palm weekend, we'll have that service here. Um, we will not have w- uh, worship the night before Easter, but, but that week we have Maundy Thursday service, and we have Good Friday as well. So, I mean, just so many opportunities to worship and praise the Lord and to learn about uh, the journey that he took for us. So, let's begin with the greeting of the collective. God is good all the time. And let's center our thoughts with these words. I shut my eyes to the pain around me. Lord, give me courage to see the reality of the world and strength to shine your light in the darkness. Let's pray. Loving God, as we come to you to worship tonight. Just allow us to release everything that's holding us back from being close to you. Help us be one with your Holy Spirit. Let's be calm and just remember, Lord, how much you love us. We are here to praise you, Lord, with music and song. We are here to praise you with worship, word, and prayer. And Lord, when we leave this place, let our hearts be refreshed. Let us be ready to go to serve you. So open us now, Lord, to the worship you have in store for us. Open us now to receive your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin. Can't get away, can't get away 
Thank you. you may be seated. Thank you. 
have several things that um, people who continue to need prayer. Um, Donna, Jerry, Wilfong's sister is still 
um, in hospice and um, look, getting getting weaker by the day. So we continue to pray for for Jerry and for Donna. Julie had her first three radiation treatments this week, and so hoping that we can she can continue to to do well. She has all her rides taken care of, so that's good. Dave Foley is um, in rehab now. Is that right, Deb? He's recovering from it. No. Lakeview, okay, all right, so so um, supported living for, for right now, yeah. So um, Barb Bartsoff did come home from the hospital, which was, was a joy for the family, and they are getting her settled in to a new routine at home. So she was stronger as she came home, so that was good news. Um, just lots of things going on. I, I continue to have earthquake and flood recovery up there. Just I just want us to remember that, and that there's still people who are struggling and still people who are looking for um, just having their, their life back together again, um, as well as uh, new people who are displaced in the Ukraine. So many, many people in our world who are really just at, you know, it, and in real dire straits. So let's, let's continue to remember them. Anyone else have anything to share? Oh, yes, Deb, I'm sorry. Right? Yeah, uh, we prayed for Jim last week, and um, so his surgeries, did you, do you know if they went well? Wow, okay. So it's still serious, okay. Okay. Anything else? All right, then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, your wondrous love pours over us and we cannot even fathom how much you care for us and how much you want us to grow and succeed. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've poured into our lives, you, the, the way that you have inspired us, the ways that you continue to lift us up to each other, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for always being our, our steady and true anchor who holds us to the word. Lord, tonight as we worship, we, we pause now to just remember the people who have so many challenges. And sometimes, Lord, it feels like we have challenges in our life, and yes, we do, but there are so many people with so many more things going on. We remember the, the country of Ukraine. And, and even the country of Russia, that people who don't understand why all of this war is taking place. People who are leaving Russia, people who are fleeing Ukraine for one reason or another. We remember the people of Turkey and Syria. We remember our friends and neighbors in California and the places that are flooding and tornadoes and in the south, Lord, there's so many things always going on with your magnificent earth. And Lord, you hold it in your hand, and you hold us in your hand. We pray tonight for Jim, for Julie, for Donna, for Barb, for all of these we have brought to, to our heart, brought and voiced to you, Lord, but, but Lord, you know all these situations. God, we ask your healing presence, your comfort, your assurance to all who are in times of questioning. We ask your blessing on marriages in our congregation, on, on love that would be shown to one another, respect for our spouses. We ask your healing in our relationships. So Lord, tonight, as, as we are healed in your word, we ask you to, to receive from our hearts these words that your Son gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So I saw Mackenzie here, but I, oh, there she is. Hey, you want to come up here? And we, we have another young man. Would you like to come up and have a chat? You can stay there if you want. That's okay. All right. That's okay. All right, let's have a seat. So, what do you see on that picture there? Kids, kids yep. Yeah. Um, what kind of kids? Are they sad kids? No. What, well, what are they? <laughs> They're happy kids, okay. They're all smiling. They've all got big, bright eyes. Which kid in that picture do you think God loves the most? What did you say? All of them. That's right. God loves all of them. Does, does God love them all the same? The, the, the hard part about the concept of love is that it's, we think of love as more and less, you know? But God thinks of love as just all. Okay? God, love is total for God. There's no, no a little bit more today and a little less tomorrow because you were better today than you were tomorrow, okay? It's like, I always love you as much as I love you, as, as much as I can, okay? There's no, there's no more or less. Sometimes, though, we look at people and we say, you know, like, they're, they're not worthy to be loved. Have you ever thought, have you ever known somebody like that? Like, like they were, um, they were um, mean to you? Or, oh, so you think, well, God can't possibly love them. Would you ever think that? No, no, we would never think that, no. Uh -uh. But sometimes you wonder, how can a person who does really bad things be, a, how can God love a person who does really bad things, you know? That's because we don't understand how much God can love. It's important. And we're supposed to try to love other people the same like God. You love your mom, right? Yep, she's pretty cool, right? You love your dad? You love anybody else? Okay. You love them like God loves them? Like all the time, right? Okay. All right. All right, so when you see kids, no matter if they're, if they're nice to you or not, you just got to remember, love them all. And God will sort it out later, okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for loving us so much. We thank you that we don't understand. We're, we're glad we don't understand how much you can love us, Lord. It would just blow our minds if we did. So thank you, God, for Jesus and for Mackenzie. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's hear what the band has for us. Ooh, the, an original. I love their, their original stuff, yeah.
Our scripture this week is another one from the book of John, and it's also very long as the one last week was. So we got, Bill is going to be reading the part of the blind man, and Tom is going to be Jesus again. So we're glad to to have you guys participate. Thank you. Okay. From the book of John, chapter 9. As Jesus walked with his disciples, they saw a man who had been born blind. The disciples asked Jesus whether the blindness was the fault of the man or of his parents. Jesus responded that it was the fault of neither the man nor his parents. This would be an opportunity for people to see God's work in this man. Jesus said to the man, I am the light of the world. See, I have spat on the ground, have made a paste with the soil and the saliva and have placed it on your eyes. Now go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And the man did as Jesus instructed, and immediately his sight was restored. The people who had seen this man begging at the corner were astonished and asked, how would this be possible? There was this man, Jesus, who made the mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. I do not know where he is right now. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus had performed this miracle and they brought the previously blind man to the Pharisees to show them what had happened. The man told them about the miracle but the Pharisees were divided on their understanding. Some thought he might be from God because of the miracle but others said that he could not be from God because Jesus had performed this miracle on the Sabbath. The man however was convinced that Jesus was indeed a prophet. 
They went to the parents of the man and asked if he had always been blind. They were afraid of the Pharisees, but answered truthfully that yes, he had always been blind. They did not know how he had received his sight or who gave it to him. Unsatisfied with the parents' answer, they again called the man and challenged him. I don't know what else to tell you. I was born blind. I have never had eyesight. And yet this man, this Jesus, made the mud, spread it on my eyes, told me to go and wash in the pool of Shalom. I did, and I received my sight. That's the honest truth. Perhaps you might want to become his disciples because of the miracle he did. It is an astonishing thing. You don't know where the man comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The Pharisees were so upset over the man's words that they drove him out of the temple. Jesus heard about what happened and found the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. You have seen him. The one who is speaking with you is he. Lord, I believe. I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and asked him if he thought that they were blind. If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, I know it is, we're right in the thick of March madness. That's just ramping up. But baseball season opens on March 30th. This year, all 30 teams, 15 games, are scheduled to play on opening day. That has not happened since 1968. You know what else happened in 1968? The Tigers won the series. <laughs> this is our year, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. It's a good omen. Baseball includes a lot of what we call superstitions. Players have routines and gestures and motions that they make before they step up to pitch or to hit. They all seem to punch that glove after they throw, you know. But for more than 70 years, all major league teams have consistently done one thing. They coat every ball that they use in a game with mud. And they do this because in 1920, Cleveland Indians shortstop Ray Chapman was killed by a pitch to the head when the ball got away from the pitcher. And after this, Major League Baseball tried to improve player safety. They wanted to help the pitcher's grip without damaging the ball's surface or dirtying it so much that it wouldn't, would be difficult for the hitters to see. And they tried shoe polish. They tried tobacco juice. They certainly had enough of that. They tried plain dirt, and nothing worked. In the 1930s, the Philadelphia Athletics third base coach, Lena Blackburn, on the left there with Connie Mack at Fenway Park in Boston. Lena rubbed a baseball with mud that he found near his childhood home in Palmyra, New Jersey. It's a special mud. Even it's in its original form, it's very smooth and it's almost creamy, kind of gloppy, but it's not gooey, okay? So you dip your finger in this mud and you smooth it on the surface and it was enough to take off the shine of a new ball without discoloring it. This particular mud actually soaked into the cowhide of the ball. So just looking at the ball, you wouldn't know it had been treated, but pitchers could certainly feel the difference. Today, the mud for all major league teams comes from a small home-based operation in New Jersey. The grandson of the first mud maker, who partnered with Lena Blackburn, harvests raw dirt from a very top-secret location and then sends that dirt through a purifying process that takes up to six weeks. The process includes multiple rounds of washing and sifting and drying and resting to prepare clean, grit-free mud that now has this texture of 
cold cream, and they send that to every team. Lena Blackburn's original baseball rubbing mud is $100 a jar. So equipment managers go through their personal routines to treat all 240,000 balls that they will use during the baseball season. That's a pretty cool story, isn't it? What in the world does that have to do with our scripture? Can we agree, though, that baseball's greatest pitchers did not get to be great because of the mud on the ball? Justin Verlander, why did he leave? Max Scherzer and Jack Morris were not great pitchers for Detroit because of the magic mud. They were great because of the tens of thousands of pitches that they threw before they got to the majors. All right, so the miracle that Jesus has performed today to heal the blind man includes mud, but, but not mud that had been purified in any way, just spit and dirt. Of course, everything about Jesus is holy, even his spit. So maybe theologically we could argue that it's pure, but it wasn't the mud, and it wasn't washing in the pool of Siloam that healed the blind man. It was hope and obedience. And ultimately, it was faith in Christ which gave the man his sight. Remember, this man never asked to be healed. Jesus engaged this man as an object lesson for the disciples. And then both these groups go their separate ways. Now, normally, when a disciple asks a question like this one about sin, Jesus would respond with a parable or a teaching of some kind. But here, his response to the question about sin was to heal the man blind from birth. Jesus stakes his claim as conqueror of sin and moves the discussion away from human fault to focusing instead on possibilities. The man was born blind so that God could be praised and Christ, the Son, could be glorified. This man and this moment show us the presence and the power of God, even on the Sabbath. Maybe especially because it was on the Sabbath, God is present and God is powerful. Doesn't it just kind of seem like Jesus is trying to poke the bear? He uses mundane elements, dirt and spit, to bring about the glory of God. Well, how does that work? Surely God would like to have fancy stuff. God wants extraordinary elements and spectacular people to prove the power of God, right? Well, the man returns from the pool of Siloam with his sight but not to a celebration about his healing, but to endure grueling questions from the neighbors and the Pharisees. And every time he has questions, he tells the story. I was just minding my own business, and Jesus spit in the dirt and made mud and put it in my eyes, gross, and then told me to wash in the pool. I did what Jesus told me, and I was healed. He can't describe his conversion moment to anyone's satisfaction, but he certainly can tell it's made a difference. And each time he tells the story, he gets a little bit more frustrated, and he adds a little bit more of his own perspective. Each time he tells his testimony, the truth of it becomes more ingrained in his soul. And with each telling, his understanding of what has happened to him becomes clearer. His vision of who he has encountered sharpens in its focus. His healing and his belief that both challenges the Pharisees and gets them kicked out of the synagogue, this is where Christ re-enters the story. Just as with the Samaritan woman at the well last week, Jesus reveals himself to this man. The irony here, of course, is that the blind man receives his sight while everyone else in the story seems to lose theirs. Oh, not their physical vision. They, they lose their capacity to believe and understand what they have witnessed. Maybe they never had that capacity. Without it, the, the neighbors, or without, without exception though, the neighbors and the Pharisees, even the parents are unable to give God the glory 
and acknowledge God's goodness in the healing. And yet God still provides. God's been using miracles and people who are not what they seem to be to teach religious leaders and to teach us for all of human history. Do you remember the story of the anointing of Samuel? Samuel was God's repre- or the anointing of David. Samuel was God's representative and was sent by God to the house of Jesse to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the king after Saul. And at the time, David is just a boy. He's tending sheep for his father, and he's serving his brothers. And many of those older brothers were really king material in Samuel's eyes, but the anointing oil that was to be poured out over the son would not pour for any of the older brothers. So here comes David in from the barn, smelling of sheep and red faced from running in the wind. And God told Samuel, that's the one. Samuel tipped the jar and the oil poured for David. David stood in his home dripping with oil, looking rather surprised and then seeing the bitterly disappointed faces of the brothers and the father and wondering what all of this meant for his life. He didn't ask for this, and yet God has blessed him with a miracle. The explanation we get for this whole event is tucked away in the middle of the story when Samuel argues with God over the leadership abilities of the older brothers. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's true. People don't see like God sees. We don't look at people or events or circumstances with understanding like God. We see the the surface and we get an impression of what something or someone is. And we, we choose to be blind to the rest. The Pharisees had everything they needed to see God, to see as God sees, but they choose to cling to human judgment. Hmm. There are none so blind as those who choose not to see. We also allow ourselves to get misled about what it is that we're looking at. To illustrate this, I want to share an interesting picture I came across recently. Some of you may have seen this. Have you seen this kind of an animal before? This is a very sad example of a pig-dog hybrid. And I look at that and I think, how awful, how sad. At least this poor animal has a blanket to lay on. Have you ever seen that kind of crossbreeding? But that's not really what we're looking at. We can be easily fooled. So let's turn that picture just a little bit. Does that help at all? No? All right, how about when we cover that part up? Do you see it now? It's really a cute little chihuahua. You get that? Okay, do you see it now? We had to go through some steps to clarify our vision. And see, I told you one thing, and your mind received that suggestion, and some of you really believed that, right? Pig-dog hybrid. Sure. You need to abandon the original premise and open yourself to the possibility that there actually can be something different. The Pharisees chose not to believe in a healing miracle because their minds were already made up that God doesn't work that way. And of course, Jesus could not be God. When God brings a miracle into our life, what do we do? God does indeed, bring us miracles, no doubt. We often fail to recognize it as a miracle, though. I say miracle, and and we think parting of the Red Sea, or, or like the man today, healing a lifetime ailment or condition. So right now, let's everybody take a deep breath. In and hold it, and out. Feels good, right? Yeah. So what just happened? Your muscles contracted, your lungs received air and filtered out what your body is going to use and converted it to whatever your body could use in the form that it needed. And then it got rid of what was left over as you exhaled and what it didn't use. And that all happened in about like a second. 
maybe two. And that's just one of the 10,000 things that are going on in your body at the same time. Our bodies are miracles. Praise the Lord. So I, here's another miracle. I rode with Kay and Bill to the regional basketball game. Now, Kay was driving, and the, the, we're back, and that's not the miracle part. On the way home, three, two deer ran across the road, and then Kay missed the first two, and then the last one and another one just jumped out of the, of the ditch and, and barely bumped the left front of her van before it ran off to the other side of the road. There was no damage, not even a bit of fur. But if we had been two seconds earlier or two miles an hour faster, that's just a miracle. Praise the Lord. Can we accept that Christ wants us to see clearly? And, and not just to see what's around us, but to see what's in here. Christ wants us to see and be the light in the world. And Christ asks us to choose hope without doubt and to follow faithfully and to obey completely, just like the blind man did. And when we do, we see with the clarity of God's love that we are living a life of continuous miracles. And you know what? We didn't even need the mud. Amen. I continue to be grateful for the generosity, and as the band comes up, I wanted to share with you that we still have about um, $9,000 to go towards our goal for getting our windows uh, replaced, so we're, getting, we're making pretty good progress, but uh, we still have a ways to go. And, you know, with Martin as our, de our trustee chair, we're finding all kinds of new projects to do, too. So thank you, Martin, for your leadership in caring for our building. All right. Let's enjoy our last song. Empty hands held high, such a small sacrifice. I'm joined in my life. I sing in vain tonight. Words I say and the things I do make my life song sing, bring a smile to you. Let my life song 
this day, but then my heart was true. Let my life song sing to join our voices in our statement of faith in action. I open my heart, eyes and my heart to receive Christ, the light of the world. Yeah, open your eyes and your heart. Uh, that's um, when they were singing life song. You know what that is? That's, that's the, our life. The way that we live our life is our life song. So I pray that we would go in peace and always walk in the light of Christ. Be clear in your vision to see what God has for you. Amen. Amen. As we go, may your spirit go before us. As we go, may we follow where you lead. May we live what we have learned Share the message we have heard And be the light upon the world as we go